Yes, thank you, Jonas, uh, and thank, I appreciate that there are so many of you staying to the bitter end. Um, it's f fun to sort of conclude this, this uh, fantastic Malmö conference with this talk. I had the opportunity to actually start the ESPA conference last year with a, well, longer version of, of, of this talk. So it's about fasting in children. Um, and I have no dic disclosures except that there are no animal experiments cited whatsoever for this paper. Uh, everyone's familiar with the current preoperative fasting guidelines. They're quite similar. The first ones w were the American in 98, updated in 2011 with no changes at all, really. Uh, Scandinavian guidelines um, in 2003 um, added that we could use breast formula or infant formula uh, four hours before surgery, just like for breast milk. And uh, the European guidelines, um, act they ask us to actively encourage um, having something to drink until two hours before anesthesia. And uh, all these guidelines, they were a great step forward because um, the sort of paradigm uh, previously was fasting from midnight and um, that was probably not such a good thing. And so we should be happy. But in this last decade, there have been a number of studies um, reporting that there is quite a number of children coming to theater um, dehydrated, hypoglycemic, grumpy. Um, and so somehow there's still a problem in spite of these quite liberal guidelines. And that's what uh, actually my colleague Bjorn Sarian um, was annoyed with after implementing the, the ASA guidelines back in 1999. Um, he realized so many children come to dehydrated to the theater um, and he found that it was an impossible task to give correct fasting times when the schedule is changing all the time because of emergency cases and, you know, uh, how it is. Um, <coughs> and he also realized that, well, clear fluids, maybe it's not such a bad thing to have in your stomach um, after all, and, and, it's, and they're eliminated quite quickly. So would they really increase the risk of aspiration? And then he just decided, well, let's give them to drink. Um, they, they can drink freely become before coming to theater. And so the, even though the guidelines were just uh, um, published a year ago, um, they broke with the guidelines. And, um, and we've been doing this since then. So do we have a problem? No, we don't anymore. We get no children dehydrated in theater. <coughs> and this is the, I call it the, the 640 plus fasting regimen. Um, <coughs> we tell the children to, or, the, or their parents, to fast for solids from midnight, because that's th the, the dangerous part of, of uh, food and drink. Um, you know, in Mendelssohn's classic paper, the only two um, women who, who actually died, they aspirated solid, blocking their airway. All the others, they survived in spite of there was no intensive care around. Um, so solids is, is the dangerous stuff. Uh, fasting for breast milk and infant formula, uh, four hours before anesthesia, and we we're, were very uh, adamant in encouraging parents to feed the children uh, when there's about four hours before surgery. 
Uh, and now this is the sort of radical thing then, that uh, all the children are allowed to drink clear fluids until they're called to theatre. And that's in our practice, 30 minutes before induction. We've been doing this f since the year 2000, and uh, I sort of got involved in this when I, I was, I became the head of the pediatric unit a few years ago, and I realized, well, we're doing this, and nobody else is, and can we really do it? We have to audit it. So that's what we did, and um, I contracted a very um, efficient medical student who audited 10,000 patients, consecutive patients, six years of practice, and there was a 1% vomiting uh, incidence, and we had three out of 10,000 that had the, our predefined, uh, the fulfilled the predefined criteria for aspiration, which is uh, there were signs on the x-ray or the, they were, uh, they had to stay overnight because of um, some symptoms. None of them needed intensive care and there was no mortality. We had some cases who they, that had coughing and rails uh, that were that didn't continue throughout the anesthetic, and we called them suspected pulmonary aspiration. So we conclu we concluded that this seems to be safe. Um, then we followed this up w with introducing this regimen in the ENT unit, which had been using the six four two. Um, regimen until then and um, happily what happened is that the mean fluid fasting times um, uh, decreased from four hours to one hour um, after we'd introduced this 640 plus regimen um, and the proportion of patients fasting for less than four hours uh, also increased from 56% to 83%. More importantly, probably, that you have very few patients fasting for really long periods. You, you can never really catch them all. I mean, you've got these, these teenagers that'll they'll have their, their dinner at 9 p.m. and then they don't, well, they don't want to eat or drink in the morning and they'll fast for a long time. But Maybe that's not such a big deal. Uh, we also, since we hadn't, we didn't have any fasting times in the big audit in 10,000 patients, we, we checked our main pediatric unit, uh, what the numbers were there, and uh, we found that 67% fasted for uh, less than four hours. And still here, a few percent will, will fast overnight, but Again, that's not a big thing. So I'll just very quickly um, uh, go through the, the sort of rationale for this regimen. And if you look at the physiology, um, th there's a lot of gastric emptying data, data from studies of paracetamol, uh, pharmacokinetics, and radionuclide data, and also some ultrasound evidence. And um, this is sort of schematically, uh, the orange line here is illustrating the sort of zero order kinetics of solid foods uh, uh, staying in the stomach. And then you've got the clear fluids following the first rate order of kinetics. Um, and if you do the calculation here, the, the, the half-life for the clear fluids is, well, somewhere between 10 and 15 or maybe 18 minutes. So if you have, if you drink like even 200 mils, which few children actually do, um, then after half an hour, that would be three half-lives, so that would be 50, oh well, 150, so 25 mils. And that's probably not very dangerous to have in your stomach. Um, on the other hand, um, if you have a teenager getting up in the middle of the night and having 
three hamburgers and a bunch of french fries, maybe there's still some st food there even six hours later. So it's not only the, the time, but it's also the volume you put into your stomach when it comes to solid food. Then the pathophysiology. <coughs> even back in 74, uh, Thomas showed that uh, small children um, fasted for more than four hours. Uh, there was quite a large number that, that um, were hypoglycemic. Um, and this could be prevented by giving them a milk drink um, four hours before surgery. And this and other studies, of course, w was they were the basis for the, the current guidelines. Um, this is a more recent study from, from Germany, um, where they showed that uh, uh, children fasting for, well, basically, uh, more or less than f four hours before anesthesia, uh, the, the, the ones that fasted for more than four hours, um, which they called two hours deviation from guideline, um, they had a higher uh, ketone body level, but they were not hypoglycemic. But anyhow, it's, it's evidence of that there's something going on that we're changing the, the homeostasis. <coughs> Then the, the third case for, for, for allowing children to drink is that the incidence of aspiration in, in elective patients is very low in most studies. Um, in our studies it was, well, in the low range. Um, and th the incidence of morbidity, morbidity and mortality due to aspiration, uh, due to anesthesia is, is even lower. And actually in children there are no published cases of, of uh, death due to pulmonary aspiration. Um, and there's also no real proven association between the exact fasting time and the risk of pulmonary aspiration. Um, there'll always be some children that will have some gastric contents, um, sort of irrespective of how long they fast. There are uh, some neat MRI studies from Zurich proving that. Um, so, what to do about this? You can do what we did, or this is a follow-up study by Denhart and colleagues um, that showed that when, when you do a, a very... Um, um, w if you spend a lot of time informing all the ward staff and uh, all the doctors that, well, we have to really keep stick to these guidelines, so we give the children um, really... Uh, that they'll they're not allowed to fast more than two hours. Well, then you... they, they could show that the, the ketone level were, were smaller in the, in the period after they'd implemented these sort of information campaigns. But that's a lot of work. <coughs> the Great Ormond Street uh, Uh, group, they published this study uh, just a few months ago, and they were sort of, well, maybe I shouldn't, I, am I saying too much if they were inspired by, by our study, but I think they were. Um, and they, they wouldn't go as far as, as allowing free fluids, but they, they had a one hour clear fluid limit, and they put a lot of effort in educating the staff on, on the change. Um, and they found that um, what they really could implement very easily was that every child was offered a drink when they arrived to the hospital. Um, that way they ensured that nobody was really um, starving. And they also empowered their nurses to call to theater when they saw that, well, this is a child that's that's really thirsty and, and uh, um, maybe dehydrated. 
So they would call to theater, w is, will he, with this child come to theater within an hour or can we give them a drink? And well, usually they could give them a drink and so uh, the child was happy. Uh, and they, w after implementing this, this uh, new regimen, they, their mean fluid fasting times went down from 6.3 to 3.1 hours. And they found that 72% received a drink within four hours of induction. So th their goal was more or less achieved. <coughs> so uh, I suggest that we should start the process of revising the current uh, Scandinavian guidelines for fasting. Um, there may be a need for some further studies, but we have to start this process. And um, there sh should be several components. For clear fluids, a one-hour rule may be the easiest to accept. Um, and there's a good enough improvement in the logistics, so, so it, it could work. And we could consider a three-hour rule for breast milk um, and um, solids for midnight. Well, maybe it's hard to go back to that, but it, it would be a good thing. Uh, in the future, we, we've got a paper uh, um, I wrote together with colleagues from Switzerland and, and the UK, um, which is accepted in the British Journal, uh, going through these uh, arguments in detail. And But there's need for some future re research. Um, for example, could we even allow a sort of light meal, which was the routine a hundred years ago, maybe a piece of toast or a banana or something, <coughs> four hours before anesthesia? That would be interesting to look at. So, <coughs> the guidelines for preoperative fasting in children, they are to be revised, I think. They're not to be without a safe fasting interval for solid food, but they're definitely to be revisited uh, maybe in respect of a light breakfast and also a shorter interval for neonatal fasting. But they're not to be left unchanged. And the take-home messages is that there's no evidence of increased risk of aspiration with clear fluids with these shorter intervals. And the 640 plus regimen certainly has, it makes life easier for, for the, the person running the schedule. But the 641 regimen may feel safer, so we could go for that. It's also very important to realize that no fasting regimen will guarantee an empty stomach. There will always be a child that, that will have something there. But if it's clear fluid, they'll regurgitate and you put them on this lateral position and you suck it out and there's no, nothing will happen. What is very important is still to identify the patients that really run the risk of aspiration because of gastric motility disorders and, so, and plan the, the management accordingly and ensure a smooth induction. Um, I'd like to thank you for your attention and uh, perhaps it's time for a drink. <laughs>